signs of the times, as Brother Craig indicated, that have only really become apparent to us in the last few years. We're going to look at Islam. And if you read and watch the media, you will know that Islam and the doings of the Muslim peoples are never far from the headlines. So we're going to have a look tonight and see what does the Bible say about this religion and about its followers. Um, but first of all, we need to understand just exactly what we're going to look at. So we ask the question, what is Islam? It's the religion that was proclaimed by Muhammad, as he's commonly known, and those are his dates, 561 to 632 AD. So he's fairly late in relation to Christianity and certainly in relation to Judaism. And Islam means submission. If you take on the religion of Islam, you submit to the will of God, the will of Allah. And a follower of Islam is called a Muslim. And their holy book is the Quran. And we'll look at a bit of that later. And they reckon that 22% of the world's population currently are Muslims. By comparison, approximately 30% are Christians. So what do they believe? Well, they believe there is only one God, Allah which is a good standpoint to start to discuss with them because they hate the doctrine of the Trinity. They think it is blasphemy. So we make known to them that there is only, we believe there is only one God. Then we have a basis for discussion. Um, they believe this God, however, has no image or form. Well, as the scriptures say, that God created man in his own image. Uh, God has never, Allah has never begotten a son but of course the scriptures say that Jesus is the only begotten Son and God is the Father. To a Muslim, Jesus is just one of many prophets sent by God. So to a Catholic, Jesus is God. To a Muslim, Jesus is no more than a man. Muslims who sin can repent and ask God for mercy. The sacrifice of Jesus has no part in the process of forgiveness because Muslims don't actually believe that Jesus died. They believe that he swooned on the cross and later revived. Um, the information on this slide comes from a Muslim website and what they say is that by the time of the seventh century, in other words by the time of Muhammad, it was not possible to find the truth because the Jews had corrupted the Old Testament scriptures and the Christians had corrupted the New Testament scriptures so that the truth could not be found. Therefore, God revealed to Muhammad the Quran. They believe life doesn't end at death. Man's destiny, whether it be heaven or hell, is determined by his actions now. So, what's it all about, Islam? What is the objective of Islam? Well, there's a statement from a Muslim cleric from one of their Friday sermons in a mosque in Egypt. It is the destruction of the West. They hate the West because of the Crusades. When George W. Bush uh, used the word crusade at the time of the Iraq war, that was one of the things that enraged the Muslims. Here's a couple of photographs of Islamic demonstrations and just have a look at the sort of things that they are saying. Um, their Sharia, Sharia law, is the true solution. Freedom can go to hell. They don't want freedom. They despise the West for freedom of speech and freedom of action. Everything's got to be governed by what Allah says. And Islam is going to dominate the world. And they want to get rid of Israel, and destroy the terrorist state of Israel. That's the objective of Islam. Um, you may remember Ayatollah Khomeini, who fomented the Iranian revolution that overthrew the Shah. Well, that is an extract from his, uh, the book of his sayings, that the objective is to conquer all non-Muslim countries, put the Quranic law in power from one end of the earth to the other. And what do you do with those who, who won't cooperate? Well, you chop their heads off. Um, a teacher in London was attacked by four Muslims because he was teaching religion to the daughter of one of them. He was a religious instruction teacher. And at the trial they said, how can a non-Muslim teach uh, our daughter about Islam? 
So there's a great deal of militancy about Islam. So where did it come from? Why do we have this problem in the world? What are the real roots of it? Well, we have to go back to Abraham. We know from the scriptures that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. And from Ishmael have descended the Arab peoples. And it was to the Arab peoples that Muhammad first preached this new religion that he was proclaiming the religion of Islam. And through Isaac have, of course, come the Jewish peoples. But the objective of both the Islamic peoples and the Jewish peoples is the one city of Jerusalem. And they come into collision there because they both want it as their capital. So, when we look at the texts, we can read the history of Abraham and Ishmael in the Bible. But what does the Quran say? The holy book of Islam. There's a quotation from Surah, chapter 2 of the Quran. We appointed the holy house of Mecca to be the place of resort for mankind. Abraham and Ishmael raised the foundations of the house, saying the Lord accepted from us. So they believe that Ishmael is the chosen son, not Isaac, and that Abraham and Ishmael went to Mecca and they raised up the temple, which is the, the, the center of Islam, where the Hajj pilgrims go to execute their pilgrimage. And Surah 2 also says, send them an apostle, that's Muhammad, who may teach them the book of the Quran. Who will be averse to the religion of Abraham, but he whose mind is infatuated? So they believe that Islam was the religion that Abraham had. And what Muhammad has done through the Quran has simply revived the original religion which was held by their father, Abraham. So their holy places are Mecca, the most holy, Medina, the city to which Muhammad fled when he was driven out of Mecca, and Jerusalem, sometimes called the far-off holy place. The name Jerusalem is not actually mentioned in the Quran. There is a reference in Surah 17 to the farthest place of prostration, which some Muslims interpret as being heaven, others say it is Jerusalem. So, what does the Bible say? What do we learn from Bible prophecy? Well, we know that the scriptures predicted the history of the nation of Israel from 2000 BC, the time of Abraham, down to the present day. And we can establish that step by step from the scriptures. We know that the scriptures predict, and principally the prophecy of Daniel, the rise and fall of the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek and Roman empires. And we can track that down through the centuries and see how detail by detail the scriptures identified in advance what would happen to those peoples. So we're going to see that it is also predicted in the chapters that we have read, Revelation 8 and 9, the powers which would ultimately overthrow the Roman Empire. So if the Bible correctly predicts the future of Israel, Babylonia, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, what does it have to say about Islam and the Muslim peoples? And we're going to see tonight that the scriptures talk about Islam in the past, the appearance of Muhammad, the development of Islam, and the history of the Islamic Empire. We're going to see that scripture talks about Islam today, the two great divisions of Islam and their role in end time events. And then finally we're going to look into the future and see what will be the position of the Muslim peoples in the kingdom age. So, let's start with the past. Book of Revelation is of course divided up into sevens and the, what I might call the middle section of the book of Revelation, we have in Revelation 6 the seals, which cover the history of the pagan Roman Empire. We've read chapters 8 and 9, the seven trumpets. 
the history of the Christian Roman Empire. And then we've got chapter 16, which we shall look at a bit later, the seven vials, the history of the Holy Roman Empire. So this sequence of the seals, the trumpets and the vials are all to do with various stages of the Roman Empire. They're all continuous historic. They foretell a sequential series of events over a period of time. I'm not going to look at the seals tonight. Our focus is going to be on the trumpets and the vials because that's where we read about Islam and the purpose of God. So there's the division of the Roman Empire. Now, as Brother Russell read through Revelations 8 and 9, did you notice the emphasis on the word third? So Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, the third part of the trees. Revelation 8, verse 8, the third part of the sea, the third part of the creatures, the third part of the ships. Revelation 10, uh, Revelation 8, verse 10, the third part of the rivers and fountains of waters. And... Verse 12, the third part of the moon and the stars and the sun, and they shone not. And then we've got it again in chapter 9, verse 15, to slay the third part of men. And in verse 18, by these three was the third part of men killed. So one of the key words in Revelation 8 and 9 is the third part, because the Roman Empire was divided into three. And you can see it there on the screen. There is Western Rome, there is Eastern Rome, centred in Constantinople, its capital, and then there is North Africa, with its uh, effective capital of Carthage. Those are the three parts of the Roman Empire. And the first four trumpets are against the western part of the empire, western Rome. Trumpet number five is against that part of the Roman Empire which was on the North African coast, and trumpet number six, as we shall see, is against the Eastern Roman Empire and led to its overthrow. So we start in Revelation 8. And Revelation 8, in various symbols, portrays a whole series of barbarian tribes who came from that area that circled on the map. Um, you might be able to see there. My point will work. There, there's the Vandals, they came from that area. But all of those tribes came from that northern area of Europe and for various reasons they moved south and they came against the Roman Empire, the Christian Roman Empire centred in Rome. So the first trumpet, Alaric and the Visigoths. The second trumpet, Genseric and the Vandals, who came by sea. That's why uh, verse... 8 talks about the sea, the third trumpet, Attila and the Huns, and the fourth trumpet, the Ostrogoths, under Odessa and Theodoric, who finally overthrew the Christian Roman Empire in the West. And all of those things came to pass before the birth of Muhammad and before the writing of the Quran. So that's the first third gone. What about the other two-thirds of the Roman Empire? What powers defeated them. Well, let's move on now to the fifth trumpet. What was the next great event in history to occur after the fall of Rome to the Goths? It was the rise of Islam in the Arab lands. So Revelation chapter 9 and verse 3, there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So these peoples are presented to us as locusts and scorpions. And as we'll see in the chapter, particularly in verse 5, scorpions torment but don't kill. These, in the outworking of history, were the Saracens. The word Saracen means sunrise. These people came from the east and they warred with what history has called Saracen fire. So these weren't cannon, they were cast tubes which shot burning material, the formula for which has been lost in history, nobody knows exactly how the Saracens compounded it. But they fired this burning stuff at their enemies and it could set their ships on fire and injure their troops. And the 
cast tubes that they fired it out of, which were on wheels and towed behind their horses, were actually called scorpions. So when God revealed these things to John in the Isle of Patmos, he knew in advance the terminology that would be used by these peoples. The word locust um, is Abe, the word Arab is Abi, and the desert is Arabah. So these are peoples who came out of the desert regions of Arabia. The locusts are described as having heads which look like horses, and the Saracens were a nomadic tribe who came from the region of Sinai and then spread from the east. And they were cavalry. They rode horses and towed these, these weapons behind them. So God anticipated the rise of these people with the description and the symbology which we have in Revelation chapter 9. And the fact that they are described as locusts is remarkable because if you look at those two maps, the top one shows the distribution of the locust in the Middle Eastern region. And during the season when the locusts swarm, that is the area on that top map where they afflict mankind by eating the vegetation. The lower map in the purple shows the extent to which Islam was spread by the Saracens and, and other Islamic peoples in North Africa, the Middle East, and into Europe. And it's, it's a remarkably close comparison. God knew from the beginning where these people would go and what they would do. So let's read now Revelation 9 and verse 4. So these people are going to go forth, these, these Saracens as they were called, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now when Muhammad died, he was succeeded by a man called Abu Bakir, who was his close friend, who had fled with him from Mecca to Medina. And it was Abu Bakir who sent forth those troops, those Saracen troops, to war. And history records the instructions which he gave to his troops. There he is. Just read this and compare it with Revelation 9 verse 4. They're not to kill women or children. They're not to destroy palm trees and burn fields of corn. They were not to cut down fruit trees or do mischief to cattle unless they had to eat. But they were to encounter Catholic priests and monks with shaven crowns and they were to cleave their skulls or make them pay tribute. It's a remarkable correspondence between those words of Abu Bakir and the prophecy in Revelation 9 verse 4, which I'm sure he hadn't read. But the angels were at work. So, when we look at the detail of the fifth trumpet, in verse 1 we have a star falling from heaven to the earth. And Muhammad was a rising star in Mecca until he was forced to flee the city and go to Medina. And he was given a key. He gained power through the religion which he preached over many peoples. And they came out of the pit, out of the Arabian desert from the, which they attacked the Catholic Eastern Roman Empire. The peoples whom they attacked would seek death. They were given the choice, convert or pay tribute. And look at verse 7. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. They wore bright yellow turbans. Their faces were as the faces of men. They were bearded. And verse 8, they had hair as the hair of women. The Saracen warriors wore long hair under their turbans. The details of the appearance of these peoples fits exactly the symbology of Revelation. And they had tails like scorpions, this horse-drawn artillery, scorpions that they had. And verse 5, 
To them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And again in verse 10, they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and they have power to hurt men five months. Five months of the calendar year is the period of locust activity. And it was at the same time of the year that the Saracens fought, paralleling the locusts. And when we look at the time periods, five months of 30 days is 150 years. And from 632, the death of Muhammad, when, when this attack on the Roman Empire started, to 782, when the Caliph Harun al-Rashid made peace with the Emperor in Constantinople, is exactly 150 years. 150 years of warfare against the powers of Rome. And verse 11, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon the destroyer. And this is the only period of history when the Arabs have been united under a single ruler, the Caliphs. Look at the Arab nations now, totally disunited, fighting against one another. Absolutely no sign whatsoever of ten Arab nations coming together against Israel, as the preterite view of Revelation suggested would happen. It hasn't happened because it's not the correct interpretation of Revelation. The Preterite view, if you go back to verses 7 and 8, um, talks in terms of this being the Romans besieging Jerusalem. But the Romans didn't have on their heads crowns like gold. They weren't bearded. They didn't have long hair. The details don't fit. But they do fit the Saracen assault on the Roman Empire. And again, verse 11, Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer. And that's what the Saracens were. By the early 8th century, they'd conquered all of North Africa and were moving through Spain and Portugal into Europe. And they were only stopped at Tours in, Charles, in, in 732 by Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. The first occasion in recorded history that an army composed only of infantry had defeated an opposing army which had cavalry. And that victory by Charles Martel, who was the grandfather of Charlemagne, stopped the Muslim advance into Europe through Spain and brought to an end, effectively, the fifth trumpet. So we come now to the sixth trumpet. Verse 14, or 13 for the context. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth, the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And so they came. First of all, the Seljuks, there were two brothers, Togrelbeg and Kagrigbeg, who came to Baghdad in 1055. And on the 27th of April, 1062, and we'll look at that date later, Togrul Beg married the Caliph's daughter and became, in effect, the head of Islam. And his nephew, Alp Arslan, started the war against the Eastern Roman Empire and defeated the Roman Emperor in 1071 at Manzikert. Then came the Mongols under Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan said to the Pope, I am invested with a divine power to subdue and extirpate the nations. And Genghis Khan ruled over the greatest contiguous area of land of any man in history. And he was followed by Timur, Tamerlane, Tamar the Lame, from 1370 to 1405. And then finally, the Ottoman Turks, came from about 1326 to 1453, and again we shall look at that date in a minute. So there's a map showing the extent of the Seljuk Empire, and see how they have pushed east towards, but not actually up to, Constantinople. The time of Constantinople's fall had not yet come, so the angels did not allow Alp Arslan, that's him in the bottom corner, 
to attack and take the city of Constantinople. But then came the fourth angel, the Ottoman Turks. The Turkish Sultan threatened Constantinople. They got to the walls in 1402, but Tamerlane attacked from the rear and they had to break off the siege of Constantinople. It wasn't the time that God had appointed. But then in 1451, a new Sultan, Mehmet II, who was called the Great Destroyer, came to power. He was 19 years old. His first act was to kill all his brothers so there would be no rivalry. And then he turned to his vizier and his pashas and said, I am going to take Constantinople. And they all shook their heads and said, no, that, that city is impregnable. The walls are 100 feet high and 30 feet thick. You'll never take it. He said, I am going to take Constantinople. And as you may know, there was a Catholic bellmaker called Urban who heard of a black powder, Schwarz powder, which had been invented by a German monk. And he put some of it in one of his bells and lit it, and it went woof. So he then cast a tube and put this black powder in the tube and a stone on top of it, and instead of going woof, it went bang, and the stone sailed away. He had invented the cannon. And he took his invention to the sultan in Constantinople and said, this will help you in your war against the Turks. And the Sultan wasn't interested and didn't have much money anyway. So Urban wanted to make money, so he crossed the lines and he went to the Sultan. And he built a demonstration cannon. And he aimed it at a Greek ship in the seas of Constantinople and fired it and the Greek ship went to the bottom. And the Sultan said, you've got the job. Make me cannon that will break those walls. So. He did. I'm sorry that slide is in French. It's a very good map of Constantinople, but I couldn't find one with English words. But there's the city of Constantinople. So as you can see, it's surrounded on three sides by water. There's Constantine's wall, dated from 330, and Theodoric's wall, the outer wall, which came later. Protected on this side by the sea, the Golden Horn, and they had a chain barrier across the sea to stop enemy ships getting in. And all around here, of course, it's water. So the Sultan started his assault on this wall here with his cannon. And they went on firing and firing and firing, and every night the Greeks rebuilt the walls, and the Sultan decided that we need a second front. So he got his men to build a pathway across the land here, and they dragged 80 ships across the land in the night and got those ships with cannon aboard into the Golden Hall so they could set up a second front against these walls here. And that split the defenders. The defenders were pretty thin on the Theodoric Wall anyway, and they now had to defend a second wall. And they kept up the cannon fire. And then the Turkish soldiers picked up uh, a very poor scruff of a man, a Greek, who was robbing the bodies of the slain. And they said, where did you come from? He said, out of the city. And the pasha said, show me how you got out of the city and I'll give you a bag of gold. So the man showed them a little hole in the wall of the city where a gate had been that had been bricked up. And these poor people behind the, the, on the other side of the wall had taken bricks away so they could get through in the night and, and rob the slain. So the Turks took this man back to the pasha and explained that he'd shown them the hole in the wall. And the pasha said, take him away and chop his head off. So they did. The next day, the sultan said, today's the day. We take Constantinople today. So they're still firing at the walls, they're trying to climb the walls. But they got 50 of their best troops in through the hole in the wall. And the Italian general who was overseeing the defence of the city heard the cry, the Turks are in. So he came down from off the wall to organise his men to fight these Turks. And one of them shot him in the neck. And he had instructed that the gates 
of this inner wall must be kept shut at all times during the fighting. But badly wounded as he was, he said to his men, get me into the inner city. So they opened the inner gates, and just as they did that, the Turks on the wall overwhelmed the defenders and came pouring down the wall straight through the gates into the inner city. And Mehmet II had taken Constantinople, and he was only 21. He had taken the city. That's uh, some slightly more modern cannon, but very similar to the ones that were used in the siege of Constantinople. He had 68 Hungarian-made cannon. The largest was 26 feet long and weighed 20 tons. It could fire a stone weighing 1,200 pounds and had an operating crew of 200 men. And it fired seven times a day because they had to cool it down in between firings. And eventually the sultan got impatient and he said to Urban, you've got to increase the rate of fire. So they did. And the cannon exploded until it killed the, high, the entire crew, including Urban. So he never saw the city taken. And then we come to Revelation 9 and verse 15. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And very often in the Bible, the time period is the keystone of the arch. That is it which proves or disproves the accuracy of the prophecy. So there's the time period of Revelation 9 verse 15. One hour is a twelfth of a day, so a twelfth of a year is a month. One day is a year, a month is 30 days, and a year is 360 year, years. 360 days, years. So that adds up to 391 years and one month. And from the 27th of April, 1062, when Togrul Beg married the Caliph's daughter and started the war, to the 29th of May, 1453, when Constantinople fell, is... 391 years and one month. There's nothing like this in the Quran. There are no prophecies in the Quran. Only the Bible provides us with detailed prophecies with verifiable time periods. And the Preterite and Futurist views of Revelation have no solution to the numbers in Revelation 9 and verse 15. So let's move forward now to Revelation 16, the decline of the Turkish power. The sixth trumpet in Revelation 9 is about the overspreading of the great river Euphrates. The sixth seal in Revelation 16 verse 12 is about its contraction. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And starting about 1820, when Greece broke away from the Ottoman Empire, and, and going on bit by bit up to 1917, bits sort of fell off the edge of the Ottoman Empire. It dried up from the edges until we got to 1917. And Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 says, the king of the south shall push at him. In the 1870s, there was an election in England and the incumbent prime minister said, if you re-elect me, I will abolish income tax. I mean, that's a fair bribe to the electorate. He lost. The opposition leader, Benjamin Disraeli, became prime minister. And within two years, without even telling parliament, He'd borrowed four million pounds of 1872 money and bought the shares of the Suez Canal and put British Treasury officials in Egypt to oversee the finances of Egypt, which was broke at the time. Britain went into Egypt. And although successive British Prime Ministers tried to get Britain out of Egypt, the angels did not let them. So when the First World War broke out, Britain was in Egypt. And the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, for that's what that part of the British Army was called, together with the Australian Light Horse, of course, and I've seen the memorial to them in, in Adelaide today, pushed north. And three times they tried to take Beersheba and they failed. So the general in charge was replaced, replaced with a certain General Edmund Allenby, who laid his plans to take Beersheba. 
and he appointed as his chief of military intelligence a man with a name about this long, which I can neither remember nor pronounce, but it doesn't matter. And this guy rode out on his horse toward the Turks. And the Turks saw him and opened fire. So he wheeled round and galloped off. But he dropped a package of bloodstained documents. And the Turks picked them up and said, ah, these are the British battle plans for the next assault on Beersheba. So they prepared their defences. And Allenby, of course, who'd set up the ruse, came round from the back and took Beersheba. And then pushed north toward Jerusalem. Turn with me now to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 18. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of Yahweh's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive have not brought forth. From this day I will bless you. So in the terms of Haggai, this was the day on which the foundation of Yahweh's temple was laid, on the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, which is winter, it's December in our calendar. Now, if you Google the phrase, as birds flying, you'll find an article written by a mechanic in the Royal Flying Corps, which was the predecessor of the RAF, who was involved in the, the warfare in Palestine and who heard a Church of England uh, minister preach a sermon on the subject as birds flying, in which the minister said not only that Allenby would take Jerusalem, but that he would use aircraft to defend it. But the amazing thing is, if you read that article, that the author has worked out that the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month of the Hebrew calendar in 1917 corresponded to the 8th, 9th of December. Allenby exerted pressure on the Turks. He told his commanders not to fire at Jerusalem, but he exerted pressure on them. He surrounded the city, but he left the Turks an avenue of escape. And on the night of the 8th, they fled, and on the morning of the 9th, the British walked in and took the surrender of Jerusalem from the mayor. The exact time that the foundation of Yahweh's temple was laid. And from that day forth in the land, God has blessed the people of Israel. So, back to Revelation 16. The Turkish Empire has dried up. That, it says, the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, if you read Eureka, and I have the greatest respect for Brother Thomas's exposition in Eureka, but when he wrote Eureka on Revelation 12 verse, 16, verse 12, the whole of the Middle East was Ottoman Empire. There were no separate countries. So he came to the conclusion that this was a prophecy of the coming of Christ and the saints. But if you look at Revelation 16, Christ and the saints actually, or Christ appears in verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief, and he comes to call the saints to judgment in verse 15, just before the Battle of Armageddon. So we can't really have him coming with the saints in verse 12. But if you read the history, what happened after the Ottoman Empire was dried up, that the British set up a whole series of puppet kings across the Middle East. Faisal in Baghdad, Mohammad Reza Shah in Tehran, Abdullah in Jordan, and Ibn Saud in Saudi Arabia together with all the sheikhs of the Gulf countries. And, and they, I believe, are the kings of the east of Revelation chapter 16. So there's Allenby walking into Jerusalem. He wouldn't ride in. He said, this is not my city to take. And that brings us almost up to date. So let's now go to Ezekiel chapter 38. We've looked at Islam in the past. Let's now look at Is Islam today. Ezekiel 38, as we know, speaks of a great invasion of a power from the north, which is identified as the prince of Rosh, Moscow, uh, Russia, Moscow, and Tubal, Tobolsk. 
and they come against Israel. Verse 8, against the mountains of Israel. Verse 16, against my people of Israel. But who's with them? Verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Persia, of course, now is Iran. And, sorry, we should have looked at that first. Revelation 16, keep a finger in Ezekiel, we'll be back. Revelation 16 continues after the kings of the east with the manifestation of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Who are they? Well, the dragon's fairly obvious. It's the military power of the old Roman Empire in the east, Constantinople, now Moscow, and the Russian Orthodox religion. The beast, the empire in the west, Catholic Europe and the EU. But what about the false prophet? It's been suggested, well, that's Muhammad. He's called the prophet, so Islam, the other great religion that's involved in the Middle East. What's the biblical evidence? There's three passages where the false prophet is mentioned in Revelation, 16 verse 13, 19 verse 20, and 20 verse 10. In each of them, he is linked with the beast, the Western European beast. Islam never has been. Islam hates the Western European system. Revelation 19 verse 20, which we might turn to and read, Revelation 19 verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the trademark of the false prophet is he works miracles. Islam has never claimed miracles, but the papacy definitely does. You've got to have two miracles proven before you can become a saint and John Paul II has recently been made a saint by the Catholic Church. If you go through the New Testament, Jesus, Paul, Peter and John all foretell false prophets arising from within the ecclesia and seeking to corrupt it. The papal system fits that pattern, Islam doesn't. We've already seen that the rise and the role of Islam is foretold in Revelation 8 and 9 and 16. 16 is all about events in Western Europe in the 19th century when the Pope lost his political power and was declared infallible. So he became a false prophet. There's nothing in the history of Islam in the 19th century that fits that. Revelation 16 is talking about the decline of the empire of Islam. And finally, both Daniel 7 and Revelation 18 and 19 say that the entire papal system is going to be destroyed. But as we're going to see, Muslims will be among the first to worship God in the kingdom. So let's move now to today, the present. And we find Islam divided. So back to Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 5, Persia is with Gog. Persia, Iran today, is Shiite Islamic and is allied with Russia. Russia has helped Iran with its nuclear program. Mr. Putin has visited the Ayatollahs in Tehran from time to time. Whereas in Ezekiel 38 verse 13, we've got Sheba and Dedan opposing the invasion of Go with Persia, Ethiopia and Libya. And Sheba and Dedan, who are the Gulf Arab states, are Sunni Muslims. So we've got Shia in verse 5 and Sunni in verse 13. So what's the problem between them? Why is Islam divided between the two? Well, the whole issue is over who should have succeeded Muhammad when he died. The Sunni said, well, we need the most capable man, and the most capable man is Abu Bakr, who we've already looked at. The Shia said, no, 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 no. He's got to be either a relation of Muhammad or an imam, a, a teacher appointed by God. So their leader was Ali, who was the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet. They went to war with each other, as Muslims rather tend to do, and Ali was killed. And the Shiites have never forgiven the Sunnis for that. 
So, what do the Shiites believe? They believe that there have been 11 Imams who have taught and guided Muslims. The 12th Imam, whose name's Muhammad al Mahdi, 869 AD, conducted the funeral of his father, the 11th Imam, when he was either five or seven, according to which history you read, and then he disappeared. And the Shiites believe he's hidden by God down a well in the holy city of Qom. And the faithful drop letters to him down the well, you know, just like children of the world send letters to the North Pole in December. But they believe that he's going to come out of that well and lead them to glory and world domination when two things have happened. The world's fallen into chaos and civil war and the Zionist state has been destroyed. So part of their statement of faith, if you like, is that Israel must be wiped out. That's why Israel, Mr. Netanyahu, has been so concerned about Iran. And there is a political group in Iran who believe that creating chaos in the world will hasten the return of the Imam. So there's the launch of an Iranian missile in August 2010. And as it was launched, they chanted Allahu Akbar, God is great, but written on the side of the missile was Ya Mahdi, which translated is Go Mahdi. They want that missile to go and create chaos in the world. And their concept of the return of the 12th Imam seriously worrying some commentators in the West. Don't know whether you remember that picture. That's former President Ahmadinejad hosting a conference in Tehran in 2005 to discuss what the world will be like once we've got rid of the Zionist state and the Zionist movement. A world without Zionism. Let's have a look at Psalm 120. Here's another scripture which impinges upon this. Psalm 120, a song of degrees. In my distress I cried unto Yahweh and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Yahweh, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, exactly the same word in the Hebrew as the Meshach of Ezekiel 38, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And I believe that Kedar represents the, the northern Arab peoples, including the Iranians. And they're linked together in this psalm, as they're linked in Ezekiel 38. They are warlike peoples who do not want peace. Here's a couple of quotes. Vladimir Zirinovsky, Russia's conquest of the Middle East will only be a blessing. Ahmadinejad, there is no doubt that the new wave of attacks in Palestine will wipe off this stigma, Israel, from the face of the Islamic world. They hate Israel. So, what about Sheba and Dedan? Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states have all got large Sunni majorities. They're tied in commercially with the West through the oil trade. They view with concern the fundamentalism of the Shiite, Shiites in Iran. 29th of March this year, all those states got together in a summit conference. They passed 15 resolutions, all against the same country. And that country was not Israel, it was Iran. They are seriously worried about Iran, as Mr. Netanyahu is. They're not religiously opposed to the state of Israel, as the Shiites are. And did you notice what Mr. Trump said to Mr. Netanyahu when Mr. Netanyahu went to Washington? The headlines in the world's press was that Mr. Trump said, two state, one state, do what you like, I'll like what you like. Underneath that, in the detail, Mr. Trump said to Mr. Netanyahu, go and make friends with Sheba and Dedan. Well, he didn't say Sheba and Dedan. He said the Gulf Arab states, but we know them as Sheba and Dedan. Go and make friends with Sheba and Dedan. Get them on your side and get them to encourage the Palestinians to come to the peace table and accept a peace deal. It's called the outside-in solution rather than the inside-out solution of Israel directly negotiating with the Palestinians and the rest of the Arab world eventually agreeing to it 
which is what previous presidents have been pursuing. So we'll watch that space carefully. So here are the opposing peoples. The Shiites in Iran and Iraq and Syria, Bashar Assad in Syria is a Lawite, which is a sort of Shiite, and the Gulf states in Saudi Arabia. Ezekiel 38 verse 5 and Ezekiel 38 verse 13. Exactly as the scriptures said they would be. The scene is set for the fulfilment of the great invasion of Ezekiel 38. So what about the future? Well, we know from Micah chapter 4 that Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the world, the centre for religious instruction, and there's going to be worldwide peace. We know from Zechariah 14 there's going to be one king over all the earth. Jerusalem is going to be at peace, and all the nations are going to go there to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We know from Isaiah 56 that people of all nations will offer sacrifice on God's altar and will be accepted. Come with me finally to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah 60 and verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of Yahweh is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But Yahweh shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Isaiah 11, God's going to gather the, the scattered ones of Ephraim and the dispersed of Judah and bring them all together into the land. Then, verse 5, thou shalt see and flow together. Thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces margin the wealth of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Israel is going to be enriched by the Gentile nations. Verse 6, the multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, they shall show forth the praises of Yahweh, all the flocks of Kedar, those warlike peoples that we read about in Isaiah 20, shall be gathered together unto thee, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee, they shall come up with, mine, with acceptance upon mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory." Muslim peoples from both sides will be there to offer upon the altar and worship. How's that going to come about? Well, we don't know, but I'll give you my, my imagined scenario. The Lord Jesus Christ, sitting upon the throne of his father David, calls the resurrected and immortal Abraham and says to him, go to your descendants, the children of Ishmael, and teach them the truth. And Abraham comes to the Muslim peoples and says, I am your father Abraham. Listen to me. There is one God. His name is not Allah, it is Yahweh. And I'm going to teach you how to worship him. And he will bring them up to Jerusalem. And they will offer their sacrifices upon the altar. And then, and only then, there will be peace in the Middle East and throughout the world. What's going on in Islam today, brothers and sisters, young people, is a marvellous sign of the times. They're all in for a big shock. Ayatollah Khomeini said in, in the book that I referred to, that because of the indolence of his own people and the industriousness of the Jews, he said, I fear that one day the Jews will rule the world. The Muslim peoples are going to be taken completely by surprise by the outworking of the purpose of our God. Let's watch the signs, brothers and sisters and young people, and make ourselves ready for his coming.